everyone. Thank you for coming to our Lightning Talk series, uh, track two on optimization and systems. Today we will have eight speakers and we have uh, in total six minutes, 60 minutes. So uh, we are a little bit tight on time. Uh, every speaker will um, have about 7.5 minutes at most. Um, and for most speakers, uh, Edgardo will be present the slides and advance the slides for you. So you just need to say uh, next slides and he will click the slides for you. Um, for questions, feel free to uh, use the chat box on the right to uh, type uh, to type in your questions. And we are hoping to get to the questions at, at the end of each talk if time permits. Um, OK, so let's now start. Um, our first speaker today um, is Rich uh, Peter. Um, can you? Uh, yeah, our first speaker today is Peter uh, Rich Tarek from King Abdullah University of Science and Technology. He will be talking us, uh, take, telling us about a new uh, arrow feedback algorithm, EF21. So, Peter, you have the stage. Thanks a lot. I uh, hope you can see my slide and see me. So this is talk on EF21, where EF stands for air feedback, and 21 comes from 2021. So it's a new algorithm from this year, and uh, we're fortunate enough, fortunate enough to be, discover a method which is uh, simpler, is better in theory, and also better in practice uh, in, in the experiments that we have performed than the original air feedback. So this is John work with an intern of mine, uh, Elias Vatkulin, who's about to join ETH as a PhD student and Igor Sokolov as a master's student at Ed Kaust. And uh, this work uh, will be presented at uh, NURBS as an oral. Next slide, please. And next slide. So I have lots of these intermediate slides with no, no, no content, really. Uh, so, uh, so we're working with this distributed setup where you want to minimize average of functions. N is very large. If you think you can think of this as being infinite, but really we consider n being uh, large, uh, but not exactly infinite. I should have some other things on this slide, so if you can click a few times for the arrows to show up, you can even show all of them. Okay, so, so there's a number of devices, these the number of parameters. Please go next. Fi would be the loss of model x on data stored on device i, and we don't assume any kind of homogeneity assumption, uh, please click one more. And uh, so all of this data uh, could, could be arbitrarily different. So this is a very standard uh, problem where we try to um, train one a single joint model, uh, not a personalized model for, for all uh, end devices. Next slide, please. Uh, so the method we're interested in is a method which doesn't really perform local steps, even though it could. But we're simplifying here, and, and we just perform one local step. But, but, but the way we deal with this is that we apply uh, compression operator C to these local gradients. So click. Uh, so this is an arbitrary contractive compression operator. Examples of this would be top K, uh, scale to random K, low rank approximation, and so on and so forth. So these are, this is a very general class of uh, compression operators which are not necessarily unbiased. So low rank approximation and top care are not unbiased compressor, compressors, but they're very powerful in practice, low rank um, especially. Uh, click. Uh, so this is how distributed compressed gradient looks like. You have these three machines here, n is equal to three. Each machine sends compressed uh, gradient. Since the original compressed gradient is d-dimensional, d is really, really huge you'd like to compress uh, the information before sending because the communication is a huge bottleneck here in the system. And the server then sends back uh, these uncompressed models. One can compress these models back, but I'm not going to talk about this. This is something that we've done in a follow-up paper. Here I'm looking at the most basic situation where the uh, upload is uh, really, really expensive, but the download, the broadcast by the server is not that expensive. Click. So now, uh, if you can click through until the end of the slide, so I don't have to click, uh, say click many times, so that's the end of the slide, thank you very much. So the problem with this algorithm is it doesn't work. In fact, there's this example from this paper by Biznosikov and co-authors, a very simple example with just three machines and three 
variables where we, we can easily see that this method can exponentially diverge. This was actually known long ago, and this is why nobody uses this kind of a method, but use an error feedback method. Next slide. So this is really the motivation for part two, error feedback. So let's go to this. Error feedback was introduced in this paper by Saida and Cothers. It has already uh, lots of citations, very influential piece of work. Let's go to the next slide. All right, so this is how it works. Again, you can just go through all of these arrows until the end. So error feedback works in the following way. You update your current model XT by taking a descent direction in step WT. And at the beginning, W0 is nothing else than just compressed gradient. You compress the step size times the gradient because E0 at the beginning is zero. But at that point, you're going to send the compressed gradient, which is this uh, WT. But what you really wanted to send was this E0 plus gamma times gradient of F at X0, which is uh, the uncompressed vector. So this ET plus one or E1 at, at the first iteration is the difference between, between what you wanted to send and what you actually sent. So this is the error that you made. Uh, now the idea of error feedback, add this error to the next gradient before compression and repeat. So that's the error feedback method. Let's go to the next slide. Okay, and this, uh, we can just go through this until the end of the slide. So this uh, uh, actually fixes the uh, distributed complex gradient set. It's, it's something that uh, works. Unfortunately, there are lots of strong assumptions here, such as bounded gradients, bounded compression, er compression errors, single node setup, analysis, uh, homogeneous data regime, and so on and so forth. And the rates, even un under these strong assumptions, are weak in a certain sense. So, for instance, you wouldn't have linear rate in the strongly convex regime, or you would have sublinear rate, which depends on the uh, two-thirds power of t rather than just uh, the first power of t, which you would expect to get in gradient descent. Let's go to the next slide. Uh, so now we solve all of these issues, these assumptions issues and the race issues through something that we call error feedback 21. I don't really have time to explain, in a longer talk I could explain how we develop this method and we, we put in lots of intuitions, but it's in the end it's a very simple method where what do you want to do? You want to compress the difference between the gradient of f at xt plus 1 at the current point minus uh, the previous estimate of the gradient and then you add the, the compressed difference to the gt. It turns out you can very easily parallelize this just by putting subscripts i everywhere, and this is uh, error feedback uh, 21. Uh, it is actually equivalent to error feedback if c is additive, uh, positively homogeneous, and uh, deterministic, which is actually not going to be the case uh, in practice, but uh, it is uh, something that uh, gives us uh, justification for this name, error feedback 21. Let's go to the next slide. Uh, so this is the theory. All that I want to say here is, is that we get rate 1 over t rather than 1 over t to the power of 2 thirds. And this is really what you get for gradient descent. And if you actually specialize the gradient descent, which means if this alpha parameter just happens to be 1, you get perfect contraction, then we get exactly the rate of gradient descent. So this is the first analysis of error feedback which analyzes gradient descent. Let's go to the next slide. And I have just one slide of experiments and then a final slide. So here you can see that error feedback 21 works better than error feedback in the sense that it can admit larger step sizes. And we also have a heuristic version that we call error feedback 21 plus, which is even more aggressive and it works even better, but it has is subject to some oscillations. So the last slide. So we also have a, a extensions paper where we take this error feedback 21 algorithm and enhance it with lots of bells and whistles, such as stochastic uh, um, approximation, which means mini-batching, variance reduction, partial participation, compression on the server, momentum, and proximal setting. Thank you very much. Thank you, Peter. We probably don't have, don't have questions. Um, let's move to the speaker. So our next speaker is um, Zach Charles from Google. Uh, he would be telling us about large cohort training. So, Zach, you have the stage. Awesome. Um, OK, so I'm just going to go ahead and jump into it. Next slide. This is joint work with a bunch of people. Um, we study cross-device federated learning. Uh, and specifically, we're interested in, in settings where you have many intermittently available clients. 
And the simple question we pose is how cohort size affects the training dyna dynamics and model quality learned. Um, so next slide. The analogy that you should keep in mind is that there are a ton of papers out there right now uh, trying to understand large batch training for centralized learning. And a lot of really, really interesting stuff has happened with trying to analyze kind of how does it affect the quality of the model and generalization, things like that. And so the question we pose is uh, whether cohort size in FL mirrors that kind of effect. Um, instead of the number of examples per round, we're now dictating the number of users. And so you can ask, are there similar effects on training and are there FL specific effects? Next slide. So uh, our work has kind of five primary challenges of large cohort training that we identify. Large cohort training being you're training in FL using lots and lots of users per round. Um, and those are what I'm going to talk about in this short talk. I'm not going to talk about some other stuff that's in our work, including uh, statistical characteristics of FL training dynamics and improved methods for large cohort training. Um, I think that the challenge is probably the most interesting part for kind of a general audience. So next slide. OK, so challenge number one, diminishing returns. Um, speed ups incurred from larger cohorts don't scale linearly. You can increase uh, the number of clients by 10x, and you don't get a 10x reduction in the number of rounds needed to train a model. This is true across a bunch of data sets, a bunch of different uh, uh, algorithms. Um, and it's, uh, yeah, pretty pervasive. It means that you can't just speed up things for free by incorporating more users. Next. Uh, the second one, and this is, um, I, I think, kind of an interesting one, is generalization issues. Um, models trained with larger cohort sizes may not generalize well. Um, and, and for simplicity, you should focus on the plot on the left. Um, but we found that, that uh, in a lot of cases, if you increase the cohort size, uh, you would actually get worse generalization eventually. This also happens in the Shakespeare task, which is the third one. Um, it didn't happen on every single task that we had. Uh, but it kind of mirror generalization issues from large batch centralized training. So this is something to keep in mind. Again, this is a, a parallel to large batch training. OK, next slide. Fairness concerns. Um, this is my favorite one, I think. Uh, and, and concern is kind of the right word instead of challenge. But um, intuitively, you would think that larger cohorts could improve fairness because more people could do affect the model. And then what ends up happening is that essentially all clients uh, are treated in the same way. So if the 95th percentile of accuracy increases by using a larger cohort size, so does the 5th percentile of accuracy. And in particular, if you look at the left, the generalization issues that happen with kind of the mean accuracy also affect all quantiles of fairness. So the 95th percentile and the 5th percentile get a reduction in accuracy if you start using cohort uh, larger cohort sizes. So um, I don't have a great uh, I can't go into too much more detail about this, but I think this is a really kind of interesting observation. Next. OK, uh, challenge number four, catastrophic training failures. Um, one thing that can happen in federated learning is if your client's data is just fundamentally misaligned with the global model, uh, it sends a kind of garbage gradient back to the server, everything blows up, and you fail. And this is kind of a plot of a not catastrophic training failure and a catastrophic training failure. And the only difference were which clients were sampled at each round. So the problem is that if you sample more clients, you're more likely to sample these failure modes and things go bad. But next slide. The solution is just clip client updates. In particular, we discussed this, but uh, adaptive clipping um, leads to basically prevention of any and all catastrophic failures. OK, last uh, challenge is decreased data efficiency. Large cohort methods converge faster if you just look at the number of communication rounds and slower if you look at the number of total examples seen across all clients. Um, and this is really important for a lot of system level issues, right? Electricity consumption, carbon emissions, all that correlates with the number of examples, not with the number of communication rounds. So this is another really important thing to, to consider in large cohort settings. OK, next slide. So this was just really kind of a teaser. Uh, we talk about a lot more things in the paper, uh, really trying to drill down into why some of these are happening and some kind of interesting observations on federated learning that, that we kind of uh, get as a result. Um, it's going to appear at NERPS 2021. Uh, the paper is already on archive. Please check it out if you're interested. And I am happy to take questions. Thanks, Tech. We have one minute left for questions. So any questions from the audience? Looks like Marco has one. So how do these depend on uh, data partitioning and distribution? That's a really, really good question. Um, we try to evaluate things across a bunch of different data sets. I, I don't think I have any formal rules for you. I, I do think that that um, we saw noticeable distinctions between kind of 
moderately sized data sets uh, where you have maybe a couple hundred clients and very large data sets where you have hundreds of thousands of clients. So, so somehow these are fundamentally different regimes um, and, and kind of led to different behavior across them. As far as data, uh, the distribution, um, that's a harder question and happy to chat maybe offline. Any other questions before we move on to the next speaker? Okay, um, thank you, Zach. Uh, let's uh, welcome the next speaker, um, Gauri Joshi from CMU. Um, yeah, Gauri, you have the stage. Thanks, Shan Shan. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, today I'm going to talk about uh, um, work uh, led by my student, Divyansh, and it is going to appear in Europe's this year. Um, can you go to the next slide, please? Uh, and the next slide. So the focus of this work is on the problem of mean estimation, uh, where we consider uh, a central server, which is trying to estimate the mean of vectors x1 to xn sent by n clients. Uh, the true mean is denoted by x bar. So as all of you know, mean estimation is a very common subroutine um, in many applications. Uh, for example, in federated learning, after every communication round, the central server collects model updates from participating clients and averages them. Um, so in the cases where uh, the vectors are high dimensional and the clients are resource limited or bandwidth limited, communicating large and dense vectors can be very expensive. So in many recent works, uh, techniques such as quantization, sparsification, et cetera, have been proposed uh, to map high dimensional vectors to low dimensional spaces. So in this work, we are going to focus on sparsification techniques uh, where the clients communicate only a subset of the coordinates of each vector. Uh, next slide, please. So the simplest sparsification technique uh, that has been proposed in literature is called rand k sparsification, where each client sends uh, some k out of d um, randomly chosen coordinates of the vector, uh, and uh, the others are set to 0. So as you see in this figure, each client is sending only one out of the three coordinates that it has um, to the central server. So on the central server side, um, the server simply averages all of these sparsified vectors, which we denote by HI over here. And then it scales them by a factor D over K. Um, and the purpose of this scaling is to get an unbiased estimate of the mean. Uh, next slide, please. So Ranke sparsification um, error has been analyzed previously. And uh, you can see that in this error um, uh, term, which is measuring the mean square error uh, between uh, x hat and x bar, uh, the error increases linearly with the sparsification factor d over k. So uh, one of the reasons for this is that uh, because you're assuming the um, sparsified coordinates as 0, uh, as you sparsify more and more, uh, the error go goes up. Um, so in recent works, uh, several methods have been proposed to uh, change the computation on the client side in order to reduce this error. Uh, such techniques include top k sparsification or error feedback, et cetera. Uh, in this work, we take an orthogonal approach and we focus on what happens on the server side. So the clients still do rand k sparsification. But now on the server side, if we look at the aggregation process that I described previously, um, a problem with it is that the server is averaging across all clients, including the ones that send zeros. And instead of this, you can do much better um, in cases where the vectors are correlated by just averaging over clients that send non-zero coordinates. So to see this, consider an example shown in this figure where um, e all the vectors are equal. So our uh, naive rand case sparsification scheme um, would lead to the server estimating the mean of these vectors as 2x1 uh, for the first coordinate, uh, whereas the actual mean should be x1. And you would get that if you had just average the non-zero um, elements. Uh, so next slide. Building on this idea, 
uh, we propose a class of estimators called rand k spatial estimators where we only average for each coordinate uh, the non zero elements coming from all the clients so you can see in this expression that the denominator has mj this is a random variable which represents the number of clients that send that coordinate and the other terms over here are scaling factors to ensure that uh, the estimate is unbiased. And secondly, it minimizes the error. So one thing in this estimate is that it requires to know the correlation between the vectors. So if you know how much the vectors are correlated, which is represented by this R2 by R1 coefficient, um, then you can actually minimize the estimation error. But in practice, you don't know the correlation between the vectors. Um, so next slide. Um, so in practice, what we propose is some special cases of these family, this family of estimators where we assume R2 by R1 to be different values. Um, so the figure here compares uh, the, these different um, members of the rand spatial family with the optimal estimator, which is shown in orange. So this optimal estimator already knows the correlation. As you can see, um, the rand spatial max and the rand spatial average estimators, which assume a higher degree of correlation, do better than rand k especially when the true correlation is moderately high uh, which we see uh, on the right hand side of this plot uh, so next slide uh, we also have theoretical analysis of this in the paper uh, which shows that um, the rand k spatial estimation error uh, is the rand k error uh, minus a term and the magnitude of this term grows as you estimate the correlation factor better and better. So if you have a good guess of the uh, correlation factor, then this error is much lower than the rand k estimation error. Uh, next slide, please. So that was about spatial correlations. Let me quickly talk about another part, which is about temporal correlations, where if the vectors sent by clients don't change much across iterations, then we can use previously sent vectors to fill in unsampled coordinates. Next slide, please. Um, so the way we propose to do this is that the server maintains some memory of previously sent coordinates um, by for each client this is represented by the b1 b2 b3 and whenever a client does not send um, the coordinate uh, you can use the value that is stored in memory in place of the new value um, now naively using this will lead to an unbiased estimate so instead we propose appropriately scaling the new and old values to ensure that the estimate is unbiased next slide please so this approach uh, of uh, leveraging temporal correlation uh, also gives a lower estimation error than rand especially in cases where the memory uh, value is close to the actual value of the vector. Um, now, you may think that, is it too expensive to have this memory vector for each client? And that's true. Um, if you have many clients, then this can be too expensive. So it, we can get around that by storing uh, a single vector for all the clients or single vector for a cluster of clients. Um, so I think I'll end there. Um, next slide, please. Since I don't have any time left, I'll be happy to take questions. Um, thank you, Gauri. Uh, in the interest of time, let's just move to the next speaker. Um, yeah, our next speaker is Nicholas Lin from University of Cambridge. He will be telling us about flower today. So, Nicholas. Great. Ahead. Thank you so much for the invitation, and it's great to be here. Um, yeah, today I want to talk to you about um, the flower framework. Uh, this is I'm, I'm speaking, but it's a product of a lot of um, a lot of effort by a lot of people, and I just want to illustrate, the, show you the pictures here, so you, you know who's been doing the work here. In fact, actually, one of the um, key collaborators and, and co-founders of the Flower Framework is in the, the channel here, so you can chat to him later if you want to find out more details. His name's uh, Daniel Buertel. Um, Next slide. Um, so what Fla So I can only give you like a snapshot of what Flower's um, uh, capabilities are today, but you should uh, take a look at some of these um, archive paper if you're um, if you're interested. Next slide, please. Um, but essentially, this is a framework we've been working on for more than a year. We're gaining traction uh, where the main aim that we're trying to do is fill in a, a, a gap 
um, that allows people to do two things. One is scale up your experiments so you can really see how your algorithms are going to behave um, in large settings and scaling it up using um, resources that most of the researchers have available, which is you know a handful of GPUs. The other main factor that Flower is able to deliver on is incorporate real devices. And importantly, as I'll be talking about today in this uh, short talk, how you can interleave these with simulated clients at scale um, to produce really um, powerful environments for evaluating your um, algorithms. Next slide, please. Uh, so this, this shows us why we need to do this. Uh, this is a sampling of some uh, recent uh, 100 papers in FL, uh, y-axis is the concurrent clients that they're using when they evaluate. Uh, X-axis is the total number in their client pool. Each dot is um, various systems uh, and what's the sort of kind of scale at least of how they're um, evaluating their algorithm. And what you'll be hearing about is how Flow allows us to get to this um, top, uh, yeah, the uh, far most extreme top um, point that's green that enables this type of scale that, that's so important for evaluating our algorithms. And it also allows this other types of um, realness to be evaluated, networking, wireless constraints, and so forth. Uh, next slide. Um, so like any, any framework um, that does FL, there's a bunch of components here that I'm not going to tell you about um, that allow us to, you know, to compare, compare different types of training um, and uh, um, aggregation schemes, um, important benchmarks. But what I'll be focusing on in this talk is two main components, one called the virtual client engine and one called the uh, edge client engine, next slide, um, that enable the facilities that I've been talking about, next slide and next slide. And so before I tell you more about them, um, I want to tell you, I'm going to show you some really interesting results. And these are the only results of um, the talk actually. So next slide. Uh, what's interesting on the left-hand side is this is us using the virtual client engine under Flower to um, simulate uh, what is 15 million real clients. And this is using just a handful of regular GPUs that somebody can have, you know, if you're a researcher out there and you want to sort of test your, your new aggregation scheme and see how it's going to work, not under a hundred clients, not under a thousand clients, but in this case, 15 million clients. And this is showing that the you know, accuracies converge. It's doing its job. Next slide. Um, another key dimension to this um, scalability factor is how long the training time is. Um, as you start to vary, you know, various settings that are important, such as the number of clients and the number of local epochs, meaning the number of um, amount of work the local clients are doing. And so we did comparisons against um, various other frameworks out there that have you know fantastic facilities for certain types of um, uh, aspects. Um, but we want to see on this dimension of, of um, training time speed, how does Flower compare to, for example, FedJax? So FedJax is, is very fast, but it is not using a real training framework like TensorFlow or PyTorch. Next slide. Um, and so what happens, uh, interestingly, is as you um, increase the amount of local compute, we see that FedJax was actually starting to become slower than Flower. So if you have a lot of compute happening locally in your client, it wasn't able just to really... It was, it was slowing down quite uh, dramatically compared to our, our virtual client engine approach. Next slide. Um, so we compared also to um, TensorFlow Federated under the same setting, flowers to uh, quite a bit faster for this sort of scalable um, evaluation. Next slide. Um, and then as you can see, um, uh, as, as we increase the number of clients and reduce the amount of local compute, then you can see also flower. This, remember this is log scale for the training time. Um, again, so this is a, a much scalable um, framework for doing these types of evaluations. Next slide. Uh, how is this possible? Well, this is possible um, for because of this facility we call Virtual Client Engine. What it is is it's a smart way to um, reduce the, fem the footprint of each client to basically nothing inside a big simulation environment that's running on uh, you know, a handful of GPUs and basically bring them back to life when it's important for the federated learning algorithm. That allows us to use real components such as a real training framework, have them at scale, um, uh, but let us have big numbers. Um, and what it also does is we, we, we bring these virtual clients in and out of sort of realization, materialization, um, and we do this in a very resource um, aware fashion. So we really maximize the amount of uh, memory and, and, and the GPU configuration that we have available to us. Um, so this works in, pa in pair with, next slide, uh, the uh, edge client engine. And what this is is stubs inside the simulation environments that allow you to attach um, real devices. So next slide. What this means is that you can have this really powerful type of setup where you have real devices if you need them, working with these virtual clients, which is the purely simulated um, uh, clients, um, to have this sort of really rich um, framework for evaluating um, uh, you know, complex uh, federated learning setups. So I guess I'm going to leave it 
here and take questions. Um, but this is what uh, an, a main new facility of Flower is. Do you have real benchmarks that require a um, thousand clients? Um, well, we want to. Well, we want to basically explore. Uh, you know, if an algorithm could take that. But it, we have strung. We have sort of run into issues in um, in real data sets being able to kind of still train well under some of these settings. But um, we're more interested in the facility that somebody might have to test uh, to strings, test their uh, algorithm. Any other questions? Well, this is a teaser. If you um, have any further questions, follow up with me and Daniel, or take a look at our papers. Thanks for the opportunity. Thank you, Nicholas. Um, let's move to the next speaker. Um, our next speaker is Andrew Hart from Google. Uh, he will be telling us about mixed training today. So Andrew, you have the stage. Hi, thank you. Um, so. Yeah, today I'm going to be talking about mixing federated training and centralized training. Next slide. So, you know, as we all know, federated learning is a great tool for decentralized training. Um, but sometimes the data domain for your federated task doesn't exactly match the inference data domain of interest. So, for example, um, you might have a bunch of device classes in your inference domain. Um, but only a subset of those devices are eligible or available for federated learning. Um, you might also have situations where on-device data caches can have significant uh, label imbalances, or they might be missing certain data classes altogether. Next slide. So our solution to this problem is to train a model simultaneously with federated learning and central training. And the way we do this is by just combining federated learning weights with central optimizer updates. And uh, in doing so, we can kind of augment the abundant but noisily labeled federated data set with curated server data sets. So this approach of mixed training is designed to address missing data domains in federated client caches, um, but it also is meant to address this issue of catastrophic forgetting that can happen with federated transfer learning tasks. Next slide. So before I get into the primary approaches that we explored, I'm going to talk about some alternatives that we considered. So uh, the first approach was just transfer learning, where we pre-train a model centrally and then try to fine tune it with federated learning. Unfortunately, uh, we discovered that this fr frequently leads to a lot of catastrophic forgetting of the pre-training task. Other approaches include example transfer. We basically share some training examples from your server data set with clients. Um, unfortunately, if your examples are privacy sensitive, this has very undesirable implications. Um, then there's also this idea of central clients, where you basically create pseudo clients that have access to your server data set and participate alongside real clients in the federated learning task. Um, and then there's also distillation, where you can train a teacher model on server data and then distill it with federated learning. Of course, with this approach, you have limited ability to uh, learn about new data domains that are only present in the federated data set. You also have higher communication costs. Next slide. So the first approach that we looked at um, was this approach called synchronous parallel training. And the idea is to simultaneously run steps of central training uh, in parallel with rounds of federated learning. So you start them both from basically the same set of weights. You kick off training in parallel periodically merge the weights, and then repeat until the model converges. And this works in experiments, with simulations, and in production. Um, in principle, uh, what we've seen is that more frequent averaging improves the convergence. Next slide. We've also explored this idea called gradient transfer. And the basic idea with gradient transfer is to augment client updates with centrally computed weight updates. So what we do is we compute a single large batch gradient on the server and then send that gradient to all of the client devices for FL. And then each uh, local client step of FL is augmented with this central gradient. And then you can you know, aggregate the client updates and repeat this whole process until the model converges. Next slide. So um, we've run experiments with Celeb A. Um, creating some simulation dataset partitions. So first of all, 
um, we can partition sled A by the subject to create non-IAD clients. And then to create our federated data set, you filter to only contain images with smiling faces. And then for the centralized data set, you collect all of the images without smiling faces. So you have a, a centralized IID non-smiling data set. Um, and then you can learn a classifier from these two data sets. And we want to compare multiple strategies for jointly learning from them. So the baselines are, first of all, uh, federated learning only, where we have access to this um, non-ID data set of smiling faces. And then there's an Oracle baseline where we train with all of the data, both smiling and non-smiling faces. And we compare these against, sorry, uh, we compare these against three mixing strategies, the gradient transfer strategy, parallel training, and example transfer. Next slide. And so um, as you can see from this uh, plot of accuracy versus federated round, all three mixing strategies are comparable to Oracle performance. Um, Parallel training is a bit slower to converge in this configuration, but there's also just a huge hyperparameter space uh, to explore with that setting. Um, so that's the basic idea of centralized and parallel training. Um, stay tuned for a paper at the NeurIPS Distribution Shift Workshop. Um, and that's it. Thank you. Um, thank you, Andrew. We have one minute left for questions. Um, any questions from the audience? And while we're waiting for questions, um, Aifa, can you set up your slides and present it from your side? Thank you so much. Yeah. Um, so I'm, I guess I can get started. Uh, uh, I'm Aifa Rosgur from Stanford. And in this uh, talk, I would like to just briefly tell you about two recent papers that we wrote together with my PhD student, Wenning Chan. Uh, and Peter Kairos from Google. Um, and in these papers, we are, uh, the, the main problem we are interested in is that of estimating discrete distributions or histograms. Next slide, please. And obviously, this is a very basic task in statistics, in data analysis. Um, next slide, please. Uh, and in the case of federated learning, data is generated uh, locally at different users, and maybe at the central server, we would like to plot the histogram of this data or estimate the distribution from which this data is generated. And all this has to, uh, has to be done under communication and privacy constraints on the data. And in these two papers, we are, we are mainly interested in the impact of communication constraints. So we are trying to understand the trade-off between estimation accuracy and communication bandwidth. Next slide, please. And we do that by using a very simple mathematical model here. So assume we have n nodes, each of which observes an IID sample from an unknown distribution on an alphabet of size D. So we assume that we know the alphabet, we know the symbols, but we don't know their probabilities. And that is what we are trying to learn at the central server. And in order to model communication constraints, we say that each node here will need to encode its sample by using a fixed K bits. And in our previous work, we have studied this problem in this minimax framework. So you can fix a loss function here, uh, L1 or L2 loss, as, we, as, we do, as I do here on, on the slides. And then you can say, for any given scheme, solution for this problem, and a scheme will really consist of two components here, a combination of N encoding functions for these nodes that tell you how you represent the sample with fixed K bits, and an estimation function at the central server, which will take these bits, K bit messages, and output an estimate for the distribution. And now, um, for any given scheme, you can say in a minimax framework, you look at its, uh, the worst case error of the scheme over all, all possible distributions on an alphabet of size D. Next slide, please. Maybe I'll skip that. And you can also talk about histogram estimation. This is the distribution-free version of this problem. The two formulations are obviously quite related. Next slide, please. Um, next slide. And indeed, uh, in, in previous work, we have characterized this minimax L2 error of this form here. And essentially, what this result is saying that there is a factor of D penalty here in the minimax L2 error 
as compared to the centralized case where the error is of the order of 1 over n. So remember, d was the alphabet size. And this means that if you're estimating distributions that have a very large alphabet, then uh, the, you can get a significant hit in the inaccuracy here. Your error can increase by a factor of d. And what we are trying to do in these more recent papers is to try to understand whether we can get rid of this, uh, this penalty here. And um, in, in the first paper, uh, to do that, next slide, please, we leverage the observation that many real-world distributions, even though they, they may have a very large alphabet size, the distribution, uh, the, the probability mass, tends to concentrate on a small subset of that alphabet. And we model that by assuming that the underlying distribution is as sparse, meaning that the distribution is still on an alphabet of size D. We have D symbols, but now we say only S out of these D symbols can have a non-zero probability. And of course, if we knew what those symbols were, uh, we can, um, I mean, the problem would trivialize. Um, next slide, please. Uh, yeah, one more. Um, so if we knew what that sparse support was, obviously the problem is trivial. You can just replace the alphabet size D from the previous slide with S, with the actual uh, alphabet size. But the interesting thing here is that you can do that even if you don't know the sparse support. And this is what we recently presented in a paper at Cold. So there exists a, an independent protocol here. Um, an independent means simply that the nodes will encode their samples independently into k bits so that your L2 error will now depend on, so you can replace D, the ambient alphabet size, with the actual alphabet size S. Um, and you can be even more ambitious here. You can say, um, what if the distribution is not sparse, but it's approximately sparse. Or you would think that there are some distributions that are easier to estimate than others. And in that case, you would want a scheme that's fully adaptive in the sense that if the underlying distribution is easy to estimate, you would want to end up with a small L2 error. And if the underlying distribution is difficult to estimate, then you would need to tolerate a larger, uh, a larger error for the same amount of resources, uh, communication budget. Next slide, please. Uh, and this is precisely what we show in this more recent paper uh, to be presented at NeurIPS. So we show that there exists a way to um, encode these samples. And this is now a sequentially interactive scheme. It operates in two stages. You first localize the distribution. You discover the interesting parts. Um, and then you, in a second step, you refine your estimates. Uh, and if you do that, now your error becomes proportional to a quantity that depends on the underlying distribution that you are trying to estimate. Uh, in particular, it's half norm. And this means that if you're trying to estimate the distribution with a small half norm, you end up with a small error. And if you're trying to estimate a distribution with a large half norm, then you would end up with a larger error. And this recovers the previous results on S sparse distributions as a special case because uh, you can easily show that the half norm of an S-parse distribution is, uh, is always bounded by S, but you can also apply it to other distributions like geometric and ZIF distribution, things you encounter often in practice, which can have a very large alphabet size, but strictly speaking, they're not sparse. And you can show that their half norm is always a constant, independent of the alphabet size. So this means that those distributions can be estimated as well as in the centralized case by just using a constant, essentially just one bit per sample. Um, and that's all I would like to say and um, happy to answer any questions uh, or I'll refer you to the, to the two papers I mentioned. Thank you. Thank you, Ava. Um, in the interest of time, um, let's just move to the next speaker, um, which is uh, Walid Saad from Virginia Tech. Uh, he will be talking about uh, joint design of learning and wireless systems. Um, Walid, you have yes. to say. So thank you. So uh, in this talk, I'm going to focus a little bit more on the system side. So a little bit different from some of the discussions we've had before on the previously on the algorithmic side. So we can move to the next slide. So the question that we've been asking for the past maybe three years since federated learning started to appear is what 
how does federated learning come into synergy with wireless systems? And by wireless systems, I mean the IoT and 5G, 6G, and beyond, right? So uh, distribu distributed optimization through learning has been a topic that we've been using for a long time, but then came federated learning, which gave us, on top of that, a structured way to do learning on top of the privacy uh, uh, aspects of it. So there's two fundamental areas in this domain. One is how does communication systems, uh, uh, how should communication systems be designed in order to support federated learning, right? Because you need to exchange a lot of information over a wireless infrastructure. So what can wireless systems do for federated learning? And the flip of the coin is how do we use federated learning to improve the wireless system performance itself? So how do we use it to manage resources, to manage applications like VR, UAVs, and others? In some sense, we're looking towards a reliable and generalizable multi-agent systems in wireless networks, and federated learning will play a key role in distributed learning in general. So the next slide, please. So first, on the first uh, question, right? So what can wireless do for federated learning? So I'm going to present a first model that we looked at, where we said, OK, let's take federated learning and deploy it over an actual wireless system. So a cellular network with a base station, there could be other base stations as well around it with interference and everything. And typically when you look at it from a pure machine learning perspective, all you think about is, for example, bandwidth and communication efficiency. But what we said here is there's more to it. When you look at the wireless systems, there are fundamental factors like uh, channel errors, like delay, like energy efficiency, that factor into this exchange of the model parameters or, or the aggregates and so on, over this real world wireless channel. So what we did in this work, and I don't have the math on the slide, but what we did is we first revisited the convergence of federated learning and we proved a, a first theorem, which I show on the slide, that the convergence of federated learning, convergence of the training of federated learning is not only a function of the learning parameters as we all know, but it's also a function of some wireless parameters. Like on the equation you see there's QI, which really is the bit error rate of the channel that itself depends on the transmit power of the devices and also on the resource allocation that is done in the system. By resource allocation, I mean the frequency times chunks that the cellular system allocates to these devices. So what we could show here is if T goes to infinity, well, federated learning may not converge because of errors in the channel. And what that meant was a fundamentally new way to look at both learning and communication in the sense that we should co-design the two systems. We should look for the most accurate performance for FL because it's doing a task that needs some performance uh, guarantees. At the same time, how do we make sure that the wireless channel itself is managed in a way to sustain that? And this is what we call joint design of FL and wireless. And how does that appear? I mean, here the optimization problem that we had is you try to do the training of FL while also optimizing the uh, resource block allocation and the power control of the system. And we could show that with this theoretical result, the, the problem becomes tractable and we can solve it with the Hungarian method. And next slide, please, where we can show some simulation results. So here we can show uh, a, a first kind of, uh, a first view on the impact of wireless systems on, on federated learning. So you can see the proposed approach, which we call wireless aware, and the baselines. Baseline C is essentially your raw vanilla federated learning without any cognitions of the wireless network. Baseline B has some resource allocation on top of it, and baseline A has, a, has some power control on top of it. And you can see that you need to be wireless aware, or, or, or otherwise your performance in terms of accuracy drops down. And that is function of the number of users on the left-hand side, and also the number of RBs, which is the resource blocks from the wireless channel. In short, the message here is joint wireless system and federated learning algorithmic design is very important when you're cognizant of both. The next slide is essentially the flip of the coin. How do we use federated learning for wireless? So in wireless, not only privacy is important, but at the end, distributed management of wireless systems is fundamental. And now when we talk about 6G, we're saying every single protocol should be based on AI. We call it AI native. And it's very natural to think of it as distributed learning because you have multi-agent systems, different devices, different base stations that need to perform a common or multiple tasks. And I'll give you an example. Like We wanted to look at the way to spatially uh, and temporally map the wireless system, meaning understand what would be the channel at a given point in time, how we estimate that channel, and how would it evolve. And what we did there is we wanted a fully distributed approach where we needed to estimate a distribution. So we used a, if you want to think about it, a federated uh, form of GANs, where we're trying to estimate the spatial temporal mapping it's fully distributed. We don't use a, a parameter server, but instead of, of, of sharing the model parameters, we share the generated output. 
So it's not as DP as, as, uh, as some of the recent FL algorithms, but it still has some privacy preservation. But our real uh, uh, focus was more on the distributed aspect. And we showed that that is more accurate uh, than a FL implementation of GAN and some other baselines. And then on the right-hand side, we applied it to a system of drones that are providing communication. So they're mobile, they're trying to also learn this spatial temporal mapping, and we can show that it improves the wireless system design here, the rate. And there are so many other applications, and we've discussed those probably in breakouts and poster sessions. And I'll end here. Um, thank you, Valley. We have one minute for questions. Oh, okay. So Nicholas has a question, so. Yes, I can see the question. So that's a great question. So yeah, one example is the one I showed on the slide is that if you have bit error rates, and let's assume a very simple strategy where you discard weights that arrive in error. In that case, the, the algorithm may not converge unless you uh, uh, have a better power control or a better, let's say, channel coding strategy. So that kind of, it's a very simple example where it gives some co-design on the wireless, meaning physical layer design, and where it affects convergence of federated learning. If not the convergence accuracy, at least the convergence time. Any other questions from the audience? Um, if not, let's move to the next speaker, which is also our final speaker, Philip Gibbons. Yes, next slide, please. OK, so I'm going to talk to you about federated learning under distributed concept drift. This is joint work with uh, Alango, Jin Yu, a couple of PhD students, uh, and also uh, Gari and um, Kevin, who's at uh, Microsoft. OK, so what is the problem set we're talking about? So we have training data that's drawn at each client at each step from some distribution, from part of the distribution. And a concept drift occurs whenever there's a, uh, the distribution before that time step uh, differs from the distribution after that, after that time step. And uh, I guess the, the slides didn't convert all that well from, um, from PowerPoint. But what it's showing is that in these two-dimensional diagrams I have, clients are uh, columns and time is rows and time is going down. And each color represents a different concept. And so what I'm highlighting here is that the, uh, the, the, the places where the concept has changed on a particular client. And you notice these changes can occur staggered in time. Now, a typical sort of non-IB setting is like what you see at the top, where you just have three concepts. You don't know which clients have which concept in general, but you can uh, you know, have the challenges of training, federated training from there. All right. And what's different here is that, that that mix changes over time. New new concepts arrive, and uh, and the pattern uh, mixes. Um, a important special case is this one on the right. Okay, here it's uh, you know you sort of have these distributed set of clients, and they're all sort of seeing the same global trends, as it were, but they're not seeing it at the same time, right? So there are certain clients that maybe their their um, next word prediction reflects news that they've. Uh, heard of earlier than other clients and so forth. And so, so you get this sort of staggering of when over time um, the, the, the clients move from one, one distribution to another. And the accuracy, the objective of this whole thing is to have high accuracy on every single time step. So you can be able to report, report back every time step. Next slide. Okay, so the first thing you'd think about doing would be, um, you know, just run, run federated learning, train a single global model. Um, but uh, the challenge here, and again, there's an example here, is that uh, locally, in this figure at least, uh, the drifts are occurring abruptly. Right? You go from the blue to the, to the, the peach in one step. All right? and, and each of these, again, each row is, 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 is a round you know, series of client updates. Uh, but globally, this, it's very blurred. Right? The, the overall change from one model to the other um, is harder to detect because it's sort of gradually uh, infusing the whole thing. And if you try to run a single global model, next slide, please, across um, uh, this, you get results that look like the graph shown here. So here, time is on the, the um, x-axis, accuracy is on the y-axis. The, the top black curve is you know, if you were to actually know by oracle knowledge exactly when, you, when each client switched from blue to, to peach, and, uh, and you actually train two separate models, one a blue model and a peach model, okay? Um, but the other curves, which have much lower accuracy, are various ways 
of, of uh, trying to train a single model without that oracle knowledge using, say, drift detection or ensemble methods or just doing sliding window effects. And you can see there's a significant uh, loss in accuracy uh, in doing that. Next slide. Okay, so we, we want to do more than, than a, a single model. So let's see, you know, uh, again, what's shown here is the Oracle version, right? That, that you know when you're blue that you should be training model one in the system. And when you're uh, peach, you should be training model two. Okay. Um, and, uh, uh, but of course, the challenge there are that you, um, you know, how do you detect when you go from one to two? And what are the, the implications of, of misdetecting? Okay. So next slide, please. All right, and so what can go wrong? So if I have a false positive in my drift detection, what am I gonna do? I'm gonna, in the simple case, of say I'm in blue and I think I went to peach, but I didn't really, okay? So what am I gonna do? I'm gonna start to train the peach model, but I'm gonna train it with data from the blue distribution. All right, so that's gonna poison the second model, all right? On the other hand, if I get a false negative, that is, I went from blue to peach and, and I didn't realize it, okay, then I continue, I, I start to train the blue model with the peach data, and then that poisons the first model, okay? So we want a robustness to these kind of clustering mistakes while still adapting to true changes. So next slide. Um, so here's an example. Uh, uh, click again, please. Click it. Yeah, there you go. Um, so what we're seeing here is, you know, drift detection is always based on some sort of threshold that has to be somehow magically set. And the problem with this setting, like the one on the left, where there's a staggered change in, in the concept, is that there's really only one good um, setting for that drift detection th threshold delta, okay? And everything to the left of that is the overall accuracy is being polluted by these false positives, right? You you're, you're have a very hair-triggered uh, drift detection, and so you, you get these false positives. And the right side of this figure is polluted, is poisoned by uh, missing drifts, right? There's more false negatives, and so uh, you know it's it's not a good not a good sign. Okay. Uh, next slide. Uh, so this is the the the, the last slide. So uh, what are we looking at to overcome this poisoning? So one thing you can do is you can, um, after you make a decision that you, you're, you're, the local client makes a decision that they've probably gone from, say, model one to model two, you can try to um, observe what happens after that and see if that was a good decision or not. Okay, so, and, and if it was a bad decision, then you can retract it. Okay, so because of this retraction feature, that enables the use of, of a smaller threshold uh, delta, and that reduces the false negatives. So what we can see on this, this graph is the, the, uh, the orange curve is, is doing retraction. So we've taken this, this sort of one point peak and we've smoothed it out and shown that you can have a very sensitive, very highly sensitive um, drift detector and um, uh, so that you avoid the false uh, uh, negatives, um, but uh, the retraction uh, um, uh, you know, makes up for the false positives. Another approach we're looking at is, is instead of doing hard clustering where you decide, okay, I, I, I'm in model one versus model two, or model three or four or five in general, um, we do something that's more soft clustering, right? We say, I, I'm going to fractionally consider myself in, in model one versus model two versus model three, depending on um, uh, various factors uh, like the, the, you know, the accuracy of the different models and so forth for my, my local data, okay? And uh, so that's, that's the other approach we're looking at. So I will stop there. And take questions. Yeah, thank you, Philip. We have about one minute left for questions. So any questions from the audience? Yeah, uh, thanks. It was a nice talk, Philip. I had a quick question. So does what you do change at all if it's a secular drift versus if it's something that's like a day night or diurnal or some sort of, you know, seasonal pattern change that you can repeat that the you know another concept that you was in the past is going to come back again versus something that's secularly drifting how does that affect you know yeah no, that's, that, that's a, a very important case um basically it, it uh yeah so we 
you can always reconsider uh, previous models, right? So, so what, some some of our work has looked at, you know, can I just uh, uh, freeze and stash old models that I have a suspicion might return again, and periodically, you know, check against those models and see if they're now good. The the key there is that you want to freeze them before they get poisoned, right? And so that that requires a little bit of um, early freezing of, of models before before you you know have any uh, chance to poison them. Um, but that's that would be the way we handle that. There is another question from me. Um, how is the method scaling to more than two concepts? How many concepts can you learn? Yeah, so we've done we've done work. Uh, we haven't done work with a large number of concepts yet. We've done um, uh, things that like if we looked at the um, the MNIST data set with four different rotations, and so you've got four different concepts. Um, here, the the um, the challenge for poisoning or self poisoning is um, is a lot lot harder um, because there, what you typically do is you uh, you keep introducing new models, um, and maybe you have a cap on the number of models, or you don't. But if you have a cap on the number of models, then you end up with these models that were never should have been introduced in the first place. And so then, when you get around to say, a fourth concept, and you've already used up your four models, then it has to default back to one of the four that are available, and that could be, you know, very, very polluted at that point, or very poisoned at that point. And so I think the, the, the challenges that we're looking at in this work uh, only increase with the increase in the number of concepts. Um, any other questions from the audience? Um, if not, um, thank you all the speakers today and also all the audiences joining the um, session. Uh, I have linked the main room link in the chat box, so you're free to go to the main room for the um, rest of the um, meeting. So see you there in the main room. And bye.